How many of you know this story? Oh, yeah. We all know this story, right? It's a wonderful, wonderful story about Zacchaeus, a man short in stature. You know, we talked about this in our uh, lectionary class this uh, past week because according to the sociologists or historians, the average height during that time was quite short because of malnutrition or people were not as well fed. So they were assuming if the average height was about five foot, because they said Jesus was probably about around closer to five foot than six, as normally we're in the um, five, five and a half up. So if, if Zacchaeus is less than uh, the average height during that time, we're, he must have been quite small person. <laughs> so that's how I imagine it, and that's how we imagined it in our biblical, uh, the Bible study class. Well, today's a Reformation Sunday, and the wall is a Reformation wall. The picture you see here is in Geneva, uh, Switzerland, and uh, it was built in 1919, uh, I think around that time, to celebrate 400th anniversary of Reformation. Um, and standing there, we have William Farrell, John Calvin, Theodore Beza, and John Knox. And the question is, which one is John Calvin who kind of started our Presbyterianism? Do you know who that, which one? The one with the book. The one with the book? Yeah, it's probably a religious institution, which was the book that he wrote. The second one to the left is John Calvin, just uh, for your information, okay? Um, as someone said this morning, they kind of look scary. <laughs> um, and our tradition is that uh, Reformation is not over. It continues to reform, and we gain greater insight and understanding of God's love and what that may mean that is offered freely to us. And so here is a story, I think, that points to that direction. Sometimes our preconceived ideas of what we believe or what we assume what our belief is is hard to um, uh, dismantle because we have preconceptions. Our theologies or our worldview sometimes um, are challenged by the grace and love of God because it feels as though um, it's, if God's love and God's grace is freely offered to everyone, it's kind of disturbing, right? Um, we thought Jesus was always siding with the poor and, and those who were disenfranchised. But here's a story of a, a rich man, a tax collector, who uh, lived off of collecting and on behalf of the Roman Empire, right? And, but yet this man had this um, um, uh, longing to, to meet Jesus, and when he heard about Jesus, um, he went up on the sycamore tree because he was short in stature to see who Jesus was. Now, so, when you read this story, it's a, it's a fascinating story because the point of it is that the theology that comes out and the theology that we read into this story that can be a stumbling block to us in understanding what God's grace might be is repentance or salvation always precedes repentance, right? Or repentance precedes Salvation, I mean. In other words, you can't be saved or you can't be redeemed or you can't be, um, what Jesus said at the end of the story here is, the salvation has come to this house. There's got to be some kind of a repentance before you go into uh, this realm of salvation. Now, the whole Reformation idea of salvation is that God freely offers grace to us. God freely offers love for us and that there's no in-between, there's no filter, there's no one who could say, well, you are qualified and you are not qualified. The difficulty in reading this text is that um, when Zacchaeus comes down and Jesus says, I must stay with you in your house, there's a, a, as if he is boasting. Right? Zacchaeus says, what does he say in response to Jesus? What does he say? Is, he, do you, is there any repentance here? Is there repentance? There is repentance? Okay. What's the repentance here? Okay, he said, I... Okay, 
Look, half of my possession, Lord, I will give to the poor. It's a promise, right? And I will pay back four times as much, he says. I will pay four times as much, and I will give to the poor half of my possession. Um, in closer examination of this text, the difficulty in interpreting this Bible or this story is that it's the verb here. I will give half my possessions, and I will give uh, four times as much if I've defrauded anyone. Um, in the original language here, actually, the verb tense is not future orientated, but it's actually the present tense. So instead, if you read this accurately, what Zacchaeus says is that I give half of my possession to the poor, and I pay, if I defrauded anyone, four times. But when the English translator of this story wrote the future tense, they um, had a special uh, category, they call it the present future tense, which is a special category specifically for this chapter 19, verse eight. Did you know that? Okay, I just discovered this too, so it was like, it was like a revelation to me. That in this story, the confusion is that while Zacchaeus is promising his repentance, what he's actually doing is he's boasting about his action already, his commitment that he has given or he gave half of his possession to the poor and that if he defrauded anyone that he gives four times as much going beyond the prescription of the law. Does that make sense? Um, so if we read that story, or this story, in the light of the change in the, the verb tense here, you get a very different feel to it. And the reason why the committee that came to translate this into future tense was that the theology was that, well, you got to have uh, a, a, a repentance, not just, uh, 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 how should I put it, um, um, the theology is that repentance always precedes salvation. So if, with that kind of a theology, they decided to rewrite the language of the tense, the verb here. Um, so who are grumbling here in this story here? Who are not pleased with Zacchaeus? Hmm? The people. People are grumbling because why is he staying in the sinner's place, right? And at the end, not only does Jesus declare that he is, um, the salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house, but also that he is also a son of Abraham. Another affirmation. He too is a son of Abraham. While the crowd are grumbling and saying, well, you know, what about the justice of God? This man has defrauded people and is giving money back in return and, you know, he's a sinner. Yeah, what about God's justice? Right? Don't we do that too? Like, you know, where's, where's fairness in this world, right? Where's God's justice? But what if God operates very differently and rather than justice, what about mercy? What about love? Right? If that's the category that God uses, through Christ, we have a very different picture. Maybe it is us, people, the crowd, and we want to keep score who's in and who's out, right? So they're grumbling. You're a sinner. You should not be uh, welcoming Jesus in your home. It should be me, <laughs> the righteous one, right? The whole Reformation thrust in the spirit is that the righteousness comes from what? Romans chapter one, verse? By grace, by grace and by faith, right? That it is freely offered to us. In other words, the righteousness of God to us in Christ, in other words, our relationship with God, correcting our relationship with God, having a right relationship with God and with our human beings, with brothers and sisters, is freely offered to us by the grace of God. It is not, we are not uh, here to say, well, you deserve this much and, 
and you're in and, and you're out, but that whether you're poor, whether you're rich, no matter what your status in this world may be, that God freely offers love and grace. It is up to you to reject it or receive it, but God freely offers it. If that's the case, it can be quite disturbing sometimes because we have this idea that in order to have and experience these things, you have to be deserving. We have to be deserving. And that's the radical theology of reformation that continues to renew after re renewal. We say reformed and always reforming based on the idea and that God's love is so radical, the hospitality is so radical, that whenever we've come to the barrier or when we're confronted with discrimination or walls that separate people, it says the reform idea is that God's righteousness is freely offered to all people by simply receiving it. And that's the story of Zacchaeus. So may this inclusion, uh, may this love of God that welcomes all people be with each and every one of us this day. And God's people said, amen. amen.